Welcome to the Bethel Family Worship Center. If you're looking for something fresh, real, and powerful in your life, you've come to the right place. Connect with us on social media to get live stream service notifications, podcasts, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We're so glad you've decided to join us here at Bethel Family Worship Center for a life-transforming message and would love to hear how God is impacting your life through this ministry. So share your experience with us in the comments below. Also, if you want to be a part of what BFWC is doing in the city of Indianapolis and beyond, you can contribute financially by visiting bfwc.net forward slash giving and choose the option that works best for you. We hope you enjoy today's message. <laughs> if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be reading out of 2 Timothy, but I want to title this this series we've been in called Purpose is Greater Than Self. And I, <clears throat> I guess I could look at it in the, in the sense that even the chair we're sitting on tonight is it, serving a purpose. And if it was very selfish, the chair would not let you sit on it. <laughs> it would have already kicked you out. <laughs> then I thought about an umbrella that it takes the rain to keep you from getting the rain. It knows its purpose. Amen? And so purpose is always going to be greater than self. Purpose. And so last week I talked about know your role. This week I want to say everyone's role. Somebody say everyone's role. I have a question to ask you tonight as we dive into this a little bit. Have you ever been frustrated with the task that God has given to you in his house? Have you ever said, I don't like what God's asked me to do. I don't like serving in the nursery. I don't like standing in the hallway greeting people at the door. It gets cold during the winter. I, 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 I don't like this or that. And I'd say every one of us have probably been frustrated at some point with the task that God has asked us to do in his house. Not just our house, but his house. And then I've asked myself, and maybe you could ask yourself this, did you ever think that your role is less important than someone else's role because you're not in a leading role but a supportive role? Did you ever say, well, you know, if they would give me the mic... Or if they would let me lead. And so we get frustrated that we're in a supportive role rather than a leading role. I'd say we've all probably experienced that. And some of you probably experienced that at work when you had to train your own boss. Somebody said, I've been there. Amen. I've been there too. And maybe you could even reflect tonight about someone who you know is infected with star sickness. They're infected with being seen. They're infected with being the star. They like to showboat. Uh-oh. Man, I'm... It's, I don't know what to do up here. It's, I'm sensing something. <laughs> Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I, I wanted you to ponder on some of those things. Chapter 2, verse 20. Well, we've really been digging with Paul's writings, haven't we? We've been really digging in 1 Corinthians when we're talking on Sundays about demonstration and power and the role that we're leading into for 2024. But in this particular passage, when Paul is addressing young Timothy, and we've been dealing with this for a while here, last three messages. But Paul says this in verse 20, and he describes a house. He said, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. Now, anytime I've ever read this scripture, I've been really fascinated by the gold and silver. I had uh, my dentist convinced me to put a gold onlay in my teeth. He said, it lasts longer than any other product we got going. I walked out of there shining. <laughs> and my grandchildren said, what's that? Come on. Come on, someone I'm saying. 
I didn't ask for a grill. <laughs> but I will say it has lasted. In fact, I had to change dentists because our coverage changed. And the dentist that, uh, the new dentist, which he's a great dentist, he, he has been admiring my teeth. And every time he comes in through, he goes, well, that one looks good. Boy, they did good work, didn't they? I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> they did. And so I'm fascinated with the gold. I'm fascinated with the silver because those shiny things, those things that are of worth. And when I've read this passage, Pastor Wayne, I've never really stood long enough to say I appreciated the wood and the earth vessels. Those are just, you know, the supportive role vessels. Mm. And I want to talk to you tonight about roles because there are many different roles in God's kingdom. Every role is significant. Every role is important. Last week I talked about know your role. This week I talk about everybody's role. And the devil often tells people that their role is not important because their role is less visible than someone else's. And if you're not careful, you'll get discouraged and you'll feel slighted and say, well, man, they are always making the list. I've been here doing my thing or doing something, and I ain't had credit. They never put me. The media team never puts me in the pictures. (laughs) And sometimes we have a misconception about our role. Because we feel because we're not as visible as someone else that our role isn't as important. My parents like to window shop. And if you know my parents, they visit every Goodwill in the county, in every state they visit. (laughs) And they love antique stores. And so their idea to have a good time is to antique and window shop. Now, Lord knows we don't need any more things. But it is fun to window shop, isn't it? To to browse around and see what used to be. What someone had purpose in. And And occasionally, I will go to those stores, especially when I'm with them. And I'll visit those antique shops and reminisce and look at the how something was built and maybe wonder what year it was built in. And I have come to appreciate the phrase that what is someone else's junk is someone else's treasure. Look over at somebody who you know will uh, understand what you just said. What is someone else's junk is someone else's treasure. And let's be honest, there are some really good finds out there. When I graduated from high school and got into married life, Um, I was no longer ashamed to go to Goodwill. Because when you have to pay for your own stuff, come on, somebody. When I was in high school and junior high, I didn't want nobody to see me over there, not realizing that if they saw me and I saw them, we were both in the same boat. So I have found some real good steel.
And I've wondered as I've held them in my hand, I wonder who owned this. I, I wonder how this was originally used. I'm going to have to take a picture of this and send it to my dad and ask him, what is this actually called? Or I thought, I wonder who the wealthy people were who owned these very fine things. And how had those precious items been maybe displayed in their home? And maybe they were put in a specific place in like the front room that you don't use. That you're not even allowed to sit on the couch. Why do we even have this room? Ain't nobody sat on this couch since we bought it. Amen. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever been to somebody's house, they got plastic on everything? How do you enjoy that? And the plastic is so old, it's now brown and yellow. <laughs> Somebody said, don't be talking about my family, Pastor. <laughs> but I've, I've looked at those things, and, and I've seen some of the things that are of wood and clay and pottery and the vessels that were old that aren't real fancy, but they're functional and they're useful, and I see stains on them where they've been used. I see um, just a lot of use out of them, nicks and scratches. And I've asked myself, I wonder who used this. I wonder if this was part of their everyday cooking. Or, you know, was this in somebody's workroom and this was part of their trade? And maybe you've gone to somebody's house who hoards, <laughs> don't look at nobody, and, and you see all kinds of treasures and think, good Lord, what are they going to do with all this? <laughs> and I've looked at those antiques. Man, I see some smiles in here. And before me, as I was standing in that antique store, before me was vessels of gold, vessels of silver, vessels of wood, stone, clay, all that has stood the test of time, all that have sat in a shop as a reminder of what used to be. Hmm. The rich, the poor, the upper class, the lower class, the educated, the uneducated, the old, the young, all various classes of society were represented in an array of articles in front of me. And my thoughts went to Paul's words to Timothy where he told the young pastor in 2 Timothy 2 and 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. But I want you to notice what Paul began this verse by writing about. Say this with me, a great house. When Paul says a great house, Paul is writing about something that people could identify with. You and I would identify with it. Recently, we were over in, on Kessler Boulevard heading up towards the north side, and Beverly and I was admiring all the magnificent homes and the architect and the mid-modern century style and the different you know, themes of, of homes and the gated homes, and, and just they were just so marvelous to look at. That's kind of what I would say when we talk about a great house is something you don't see on every block. Amen. All the houses in this community of Bethel Family Worship Center have a similar look, except there's one house directly across the parking lot that is very large. And I don't know how many people have said, that must be your house, Pastor. <laughs> I'm like, I've never been over there. <laughs> well, I lie. I have been over there. I didn't mean to lie, but I'm saying I have visited and passed tracks out. But I haven't gone into that house, and I haven't looked at But when the lights are on and it's dark, you can peek. Uh, <laughs> but Paul says a great house, a great house, and he uses a word by the word great is Miguel, which is a Greek word, and he depicts something that is very large. And then the word house is oikos, the regular word for a house. So when you put... The two words together, oikos migao, he's saying a very large house. That's what he's saying. He's painting a picture. This is a very large house. So he has to reach into secular thinking and borrow an example to make a point to us. 
that in a great house, there are certain things. Remnants of large, elegant residences that Paul had seen and Paul had been to are still intact today. Some are evident in the cities of like Rome and Athens and Pompeii and, and even ancient Ephesus. There are still great big edifices and houses that Paul in his life would have seen. And such homes belonged to people who were wealthy and of the upper class and they were splendid homes. They were grandiose homes. They were something to write about. Paul used the illustration of these impressive houses so that he could depict the majesty of God's house. He talked about a very great house so he could compare that to God's house and say that God's house is the grandest and the greatest of them all. That was a weak amen. God's house is the greatest and the grandest of them all. There it is. And so Paul uses this illustration and he went on to say that as the large homes of a wealthy in God's house, like these homes, he said in those homes, write this down, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth in our passage. Vessels of gold and silver, but also vessels of wood and earth. Now the word vessels is the Greek word sekuos. And this word, refers to a vessel or a container or a utensil. So he said in that house, you're going to find vessels, utensils, containers, and they all have a specific designated purpose. They could be bags, they could be cups, they could be bowls, kitchen items, things to carry around the house, in the house, some vessels will be put on public display. You know, in our house, we have a china cabinet. We're not allowed to eat off of it, but we have a china cabinet. With all this china, once in a while, we break that china out and we have a nice fancy meal. That's always a special time. But we don't keep that out where it can get knocked over. We don't put that in the dishwasher. We have to hand wash all that. Mm. Vessels in your house are all different and unique. Think about some of the vessels you use. Vessels that are made from wood and earth are vessels that I call functional vessels, functional items that you and I would use for everyday household chores. I got an old Lowe's bucket because there are people in this church that keep me stocked on uh, firewood. And I use that old Lowe's bucket to walk out to the wood pile and put all my wood in it, and then I carry that bucket in, and I set it right in the garage, right by the mudroom door, so that when it gets cold, I don't have to go all the way outside because that Lowe's bucket, as dirty as it is and stained up and, and uh, not very attractive, it serves the purpose. It's very functional. Come on now. So those earth and wood vessels are functional vessels that you use for everyday chores. And maybe you have some on your countertop. You know, you have a vessel that holds the flour, a vessel that holds the sugar, amen? A, a vessel that holds the tea bags, uh, whatever else you got in there. And there are sometimes I've come home and my wife has found a whole new set of those and I don't know if, what I'm getting. I don't know if it's sugar or salt. And I said, because I'm a creature of habit. Can't we just use the same salt shaker? She watch. I just got used to this. Come on, somebody. But she won't mix it up and make sure that the vessels vary. <laughs> Come on. We got a vessel for holidays. We got a vessel for, uh, you know, uh, good drinking glasses, uh, 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 children-proof glasses. We have vessels for bowls and cups. And, and all of you have that too, I'm sure, that are vessels that are everyday use, functional use. Uh, you know, when you aren't trying to impress anybody, you will get the vessel called paper plate. <laughs> and you will use it because you don't have to wash a paper plate. 
You don't have to remember to not just put it in the sink. And then someone say, you know that can go right in the dishwasher, don't you? But if it's a paper plate, come on, somebody, and a red Solo cup, oh, you can just stay fancy free, amen, and don't ever have to wash anything. Come on, somebody. Now, I do think that we ought to step it up a little bit and have a nice meal at the table and use real dishes. (laughs) But you could distinguish an everyday functional vessel, stay with me, from something that is only really used in exhibition. You only bring it out for the, for the people that you're trying to impress. <laughs> and you watch them real close to make sure they don't drop it. <laughs> you keep uh, those fancy things out um, and you teach your children not to touch them. You know, my mom uh, didn't put stuff away. My wife didn't put stuff away when Caitlin was little. She just taught her, you don't touch. Now, I know everybody's different, uh, especially if you've broken stuff, and have stained stuff, you get aggravated, you just put everything away. But I would say that you put certain things out that stay out because they remind you of something. And they're on display for a purpose and a reason. Gold and silver objects are meant to be seen. Mm. Gold and silver objects are meant to be admired and appreciated rather than just your everyday practical function. And so there is no doubt that Paul was describing real gold and real silver because he uses the word kuros or kursos, the Greek word for gold, and arguus, the Greek word for silver. And then he come along and use the Greek word for wood, zulina, which describes any vessel that is made out of wood. And the word earth is the Greek word ostkrinos, help me somebody, which refers to pottery. And so you have these vessels of gold and silver and wood and earth and in the translation of the Bible commentaries that he uses the real root word. That he's not using uh, a, just a distant cousin of an adjective, but he's using the real word. And so what a variety of vessels that Paul would begin to describe in this great house and lay emphasis to the root word. That in a great house you will find gold. You will find silver. You will find wood, and you will find earth. And with this example, write this down, Paul teaches us that all kinds of vessels and people are needed in God's house. Every vessel is needed in God's house. Imagine how dysfunctional a house would be if all the vessels, if it were made of gold, silver, or precious stone, or porcelain, Can you imagine how weird that would be? You couldn't function in a house where you only could use vessels of gold and silver and precious stone or highly priced porcelain. In fact, you would probably be afraid to even move because you were afraid you would break something and you didn't want to knock it off the shelf and put a chip in it and get the blame. And when they come back and say, does anybody know who left the space? I mean, does anybody know who put a chip in this and nobody's saying nothing? I did like everybody else. Because using those types of vessels would be dysfunctional. Come on, stay with me. For a house to function normally, It needs some regular pots and pans. (laughs) The utensils in the kitchen, they don't receive the same admiration as the more elegant objects that are displayed in the living room or the dining room or in the showcase. But the kitchen utensils are indispensable for the proper functioning of a house. Mm. The pots and pans are indispensable for the proper functioning 
of a house. And the pots and pans don't get a lot of credit. The pots and pans don't get a lot of polish. Oh, they get wiped away. They get rinsed. And they get sanitized. But they don't get a lot of hoopla. When's the last time you took a selfie with you in your iron skillet? (laughs) It's been a minute. Because they don't go on display. They got scratches in them. They got some rust spots in them. They got some dents and dings in them. Who am I preaching to? But they're very functional. In fact, try to run your house without it. You need that little loaf pan. You need that little Tupperware sealed container that your grandma gave you 30 years ago. It's still working. Try to cook bacon and eggs in a porcelain vase. Try to cook bacon and eggs with a spatula made of gold and silver. And you will quickly be reminded of how important the pots and pans are. And how important the old functional things are. Come on, some of you here tonight, you have your favorite pot. You have, and I don't mean marijuana. You have your favorite skillet. <laughs> you have your favorite dish. Come on, church. You got your... You, <laughs> Remember what I said? Paul knew his audience, didn't I say that? (laughs) You got your favorite pan that you like to cook things in. There's some pans that you wouldn't even attempt to make gravy in. But then there's some that you'll pull out and say, oh, it has a gravy anointing on it. It's been tried by fire. (laughs) It has come through the oven. (laughs) Amen. You know that it's a worthy functionally item. And so Paul had to reach in and use the illustration of a great house and reach back in and use the illustration of the imagery of wood and earth and gold and silver. Paul let us know, write this down, that there's all kinds of vessels. People with different functions and roles are needed in God's house. Oh, I appreciate the porcelain people. (laughs) I appreciate the alabaster people. I appreciate the people who won't praise God because they don't want to wrinkle their suit. I do appreciate them. I appreciate everybody. But oh, there's something to be said about the pot and pan people. There's something to be said about the old... Uh, pot holder people, old pot holders that have got burn marks on them, got food stains on them, but have kept your hand from burning because they knew how to function in their role. Oh my God. Uh, They knew where to be and when to be. They were right where they were supposed to be in the drawer, right next to the stove so that when it was time to pull out uh, the croissants and the time to pull out the chocolate cake and time to pull out the old buttermilk biscuits, you could reach over and get the pot holder that has been a functioning item for a long time. Oh, I wish I could preach in here. Somebody, if you love pancakes, say amen. If you, if you love anything that's worthy to be on the Food Network, say amen. You know what I'm talking about. I just like to have an old pot holder. Don't give me something that is so new. I can't, it's so stiff. I can't even get my hand in it. Give me something that grandma had. Give me something that the old saints had. I wish I could preach tonight and tell you I'm thankful for every new thing that is happening in the kingdom of God. But are there are something to be said where the Bible said ask for the old path and seek it and walk therein. I'm thankful for the power of God that moves in this diverse generation that we have. I'm thankful for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that is raising up a dynamic group of millennials and people who are hungry for the authenticity of God and they don't want form and they don't want fashion and they're not even impressed by the building but 
but oh I'm more thankful for a move of the real Holy Ghost that will bring you out of addiction and bring you out of compromise and bring you out of suicidal thoughts and bring you out of a messed up dysfunctional mind I'd rather have that any day I've been in storefronts that didn't have no light didn't have no powerpoint but I felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost and my heart was pricked and I had deep contrition in the presence of God and I wanted to humble myself and pray in his face and say God I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee ask for the old pot holder ask for them old pots and pans they still work well I got on my Amazon Christmas list a set of new pots and pans Ain't nothing wrong with that either. But you better keep one on backup. Some of you will catch that. You better keep something on backup. I, I'm going to call some num names here tonight. I'm naming people. No, I'm really not, but I'm, I'm going to ask if you serve... I only need one person from each group that I call. Only one person. Now don't run each other down, but be. If you are, if you serve on the usher team, I need one person to come up here. Well, come or don't, just come on up here. Stand right. I need someone who serves in the parking lot to come up here. God, brother, coming. I need a deacon to come up here. Here come Brother Ron. I need someone who serves as a greeter to stand up here. Now stretch out across the back. Someone who serves, what I say, a greeter. I need one greeter. Here comes a greeter. I need someone who serves at the resource booth in the, uh, the bookstore. One person that serves in the resource center. Amen. Here comes a resourcer. I need someone who serves in VIP ministry, the very important kids ministry. I need someone who serves in the Connections Cafe to come up here. I need someone who serves in Taste of Grace ministry to come up here. <laughs> I see, I need someone who serves in hospitality to come up here. You cook, you, you're here for funeral dinners, you help serve, come on up here, amen. I need someone who serves in the media ministry to come up here. Thank you. I need someone who serves on the worship team to come up here. I need someone who serves in Little Village to come up here. comes a care. Someone who serves in Kidsville. Kidsville. Come on up here. Someone who serves in Kid City. <laughs> How about someone who serves in 317 ministry? You serve in the, on the 317 team. A volunteer, you're a coach, you're a I need someone who serves in transportation ministry to come up here. Thank you. Someone who serves in food pantry. <laughs> someone who serves in the choir. You sing in the choir. Amen. Someone who serves in the adult dance ministry. Someone who serves in hope ministry. Marriage ministry. Be kids daycare.
photography ministry. You take pictures during the service. Look at there. Young adult ministry. Maintenance ministry. <laughs> Landscape ministry. <laughs> now, this is just a sampling. I probably missed some ministries and didn't get them all up here, but I want them all to come that came, that come. Look how different each one of these people are. All different, all important. Would you say that? Amen. 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 <clears throat> and what was true when Paul said that at a great house are vessels of gold and silver and wood and earth is true of this house. It's true of these people. All different. Amen. They all have their different personalities. Amen? Some of them are real laughy. Some of them are real quiet, right? But they're human vessels. And they all have various gifts and talents. And they have things that are essential to the effectiveness of this house. That we couldn't function if these folks didn't serve. Some of these people have visible roles. Look at Terry. You can't get more visible than this. <laughs> he stands out. Do you know how many people, pastors and visitors and ministers have told me that when they come to conferences here, they recommend, they commend this man right here. They say. <laughs> and he was, along with the team, he was out there on Sunday in the rain, bringing people safely on, bringing y'all in, bring them on in, amen. Some of them are very visible, right? Some are very invisible. You don't see them, but you see their work. I think over here, Rick and Leela. He's out here mowing this yard, keeping it clean and crisp, and has others helping him too on his team. I've commented him to Many times, I don't know that I've ever seen our church look as good as it does. You have kept it pristine. <laughs> Amen. Leela, she's in here, got her gospel music on, putting those, praying over your seat while she's cleaning, praying. Others on, on her team, they'll be in the bathroom cleaning, praying, believe in God. Those are invisible. Those are people you see every day, right? You just see that things got tidied up and clean. Look at Donna Wolf. She's back here leading this uh, media ministry back here in the, in the coordinating of the camera workers and getting people signed up and lined up. And she said, join the team today. <laughs> She'll be waiting at the altar for you. Amen. Amen. And so all of these folks, and, and you know, we could just go on and on and on, and I'd like to, but they all serve somewhere in this house. And they are visible, and they are invisible. Now, before they go off this platform tonight, we won't give them something. I just happen to have a $10 coffee card for you. There you go, Bruce. Pass it. I hope we have enough. If we don't, we can blame someone else. But I, no, I'm teasing. We got enough. And as these folks are standing in the gap, making up ahead, just serving, we didn't have to. Now, I will say, now I'm, I'm going to have to say something here that I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know that we had to twist anybody's arm to serve. I don't know if we had to lay a guilt trip on them. You know, the book of Jude, thank you. The book of Jude says that some people you save through fear. <laughs> I, 
I don't know if we pulled that card. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we have. But most of the people here saw a need and said, I want to fill the need. They seldom get a thank you. They seldom get a pat on the back. Once in a while they get a text, maybe encouraging them, saying, you did a great job. Thank you for all you do in the kingdom. They're not here to be seen. Some of them will be because in a great house there are vessels of silver and gold and earth and wood. But we all serve somewhere and we serve with integrity. And we serve with transparency and we serve in truth and our yay is yay and our nay is nay and I don't ever have to wonder if these people are going to be where they are someone else has to wonder that I just get up here and get to preach to them but I'm saying all of us serve somewhere give them all a hand would you do that Everyone's role. Say that with me. Everyone's role. They work behind the scenes, and if they didn't do their part, I couldn't do my part. All of the people that you saw up here helped me preach. They helped me preach. I never forget when we first started in ministry, and we were here, and we were at the old campus on South High School Road. <laughs> and I remember it was Pastor Beverly and I was trying to help lead to worship. I had a Roland KR33 keyboard. It was me and Sister Betty Stanifer on the accordion. And we were trailblazing. And we were amping up. Yes, I'm leaning. Leaning, safe and secure from all along. Yes, I'm leaning, leaning, the, the everlasting. Amen. And we would amp up every hymn. And back in the day, we didn't have a video projector. We had a, tr we had a, uh, a, uh, transparencies and you had to be quick on them transparencies and we put them up on the wall and then there was somebody saying I don't like all this new technology it was a transparency and then that whoever was doing that they'd have their hand in the way they'd be a course behind And you had to tell them, you're not supposed to be up here worshiping. <laughs> you're supposed to be changing these transparencies so that we can worship. <laughs> then we upgraded from transparencies to, uh, uh, con what's that called? Uh, a slide projector, a slide projector. And we had this one faithful brother. And you go forward and backward. We're going to go to third verse. We thought we was high tech. We got us a slide projector. We'd be trying to print them out on transparency paper. Cut them and put them in them slides. Be all typed, fudged, smudged. But we, we thought we was something. And then we got a video projector. Ooh. We're moving on up. <laughs> we was going somewhere. And all them people that was against technology, if you didn't have it now, they'd complain. They expect our church, we better have this and we better have that. You know what I'm saying. We come a long way, haven't we? And I remember when it was just me and Pastor Bev, and she was working in the medical field, and I was working at the church, trying to do everything, clean the church, answer the phones, prepare messages, answer the door, just everything. I remember trying to do it all, because back in the day, there wasn't no staff. There wasn't nobody. I was just doing it. 
And I remember this couple wanted to get married. And uh, they asked me if I'd do the wedding. And I said, well, sure. And they, they had been together and had children, but they'd never been married. And they said, would you marry us? I said, I'd be happy to. So we set a Saturday aside and their family and friends came. And the only problem was we didn't have no musicians that were able to be there. Betty couldn't get on her accordion. And we had a big Steinway six foot baby grand piano. And the only thing I knew to do was I'm gonna to have to practice these songs and then I'm gonna to have to go over to the pulpit and do the wedding. So I practiced, I got an old course book I found that had the bridal course in it, which is the course they come in on. And then I practiced the wedding march, which is what you march out on. And you know, the wedding march says, that was the, the, you know. And so I had prepared and rehearsed. So I did the bridal chorus. I was on the piano over here on this side of the church playing as they were coming in. Then I moved into some 80s slow music. Hello. I mean. Come on. I was trying to pull anything out that I couldn't read music, but I could I could put the letters above it and try to chord it. Is it me you're looking for? <laughs> I got them all the way down to the altar. And when they got, Pastor, when they got to the altar, I had to jump up and run over to the pulpit. Dearly friends and beloved, we have gathered here together. It was just me. Now, Pastor Bev, she was taking pictures. She was the photographer. So I did the wedding, and then I said the prayer and announced them and said, you may kiss the bride. Then I ran back over to the piano. And instead of playing the wedding march, I accidentally started playing Joy to the World. Da, 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 da. And by that time I realized I was playing Joy to the World, I was already into it, I just kept playing it. They didn't even know. My God, I needed a team like this up here on this platform. Let's stand. Don't let the devil badger you into thinking that your role isn't important. Maybe it's not as visible as someone else's, but it is just as important. It's important to me. The part you play is important. We're counting on you. We're counting on everyone to step up to the plate and serve and to do their very best because everyone has a role, not just one or two. Maybe you're behind the scenes. That's okay. You're serving the king. And the king will come looking for you. The king will come looking for you where he planted you. And he'll ask you, have you been faithful? You had all this time. Were you faithful? I encourage you today to say yes to the role that God has called you. Maybe you've given up. Maybe you've thrown your arms up and said, I'm done. I ask you to one more time, throw your arms up and embrace it. And say, yes, Lord. Heads are bowed today. Father, I pray tonight, God, you know who you're speaking to. And I know you're speaking to me. You're speaking to me so strongly, Lord, about my role and where I serve. And God, I, I admit that in the past, there have been times when I was tempted to quit times that I wanted to walk away, times when I thought, I don't know that I can do this anymore. But somehow you made it clear to me more than once that my role is my role because I'm serving in your house and it's vital. And if I quit, if I walk away from my role, someone will suffer because of it. 
So give me grace to embrace. Oh, ita bakosa. Give me grace to embrace the role that you would place me in that I would serve with the very best of my ability. You're here tonight and you maybe could confess like me. You're not a complainer. You don't be moan. You know the task is before you and it's heavy at times, but it's also happy at times. But I want you to renew your yes to the Lord and say, God, give me the grace to embrace, to serve with the team. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, search our heart. Search our heart. And so lay your hand upon your chest if you feel that you can. And ask the Lord to restore what's been lost. Ask him to renew. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I sense that people are experiencing the love of God surrounding their heart tonight. This day, as we surrender everything to God. I don't know what God's perfect plan is for you. Only God can speak that to your heart. I've learned this though. Men can only confirm what God has already spoken. And if God has spoken it to you, he will confirm that word to those that you have trusted to pray over you and to lead you and have invested much in you. So I would ask you to always say, God, I am available for you. I want to be found doing your work, and I want to do it with my whole heart. In fact, Lord, it's not even about me. It's about the team. It's about you. It's about all the people whose lives will be impacted by my obedience. And so I'm surrendered to you, God. I'm thankful. I say yes to you. Let's sing this song, whatever they've prepared. Let's sing it to God. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope you've had a powerful experience. We want to take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. If you've made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, you can visit our website at bfwc.net. Also, if you didn't get a chance to give online during today's message and would like to contribute financially, you can visit us at bfwc.net forward slash giving and choose the option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you and God bless.